morning and welcome to the combined, is it 10.04? No, 10.03. 10.03 service at the Union Church of South Foxborough, the combined 8 and 10 a.m. Glad to have all of you who are here today. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on live stream from wherever you are. We're so happy to have you join us also. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much that we may gather in this place today to worship you, to exalt your name in song and in word. Father, may you today teach us your way, and may you also hear the gratitude in our hearts for all you have done for us. We bless your name and thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Some other announcements. We have a potluck following this service in the fellowship hall. You are invited to stay for that. Our special guest will be taking uh, some questions. This Saturday, November 2nd, it's already on your calendar, right? It is the worship con it's at, on Stevens. It's the worship concert at 6.30 p.m. entitled Yesterday, Today, and Forever. There'll be a combination of newer music and classic hymns. You won't want to miss it. Our Mommy and Me program group is meeting on Tuesdays from 10 to 11.30 a.m. I hung out with them Tuesday, and it was really awesome to chat with some of them. This is for caregivers and children five years of age and under. So if you know any, please feel free to invite them. Two words of thanks from me to you. Thank you to all who helped with Treat Street. We had a lot of people come through, not as many as during COVID, but it was a great turnout. It was a wonderful time. People were, good morning. People were happy to be here. Mary is better. I'm so glad. Um, I checked with some families and they said their kids had a wonderful time, so thank you so much to all of you who helped with that outreach. Also, there are more shoe boxes, Christmas child shoe boxes, some out there, some in here. If you would like to still take one or two and fill those up to go somewhere around the world, you can track it and see where it goes. And the thing I wanted to thank you regarding that is they flew out of here last week. So people at Union Church are always so kind and so generous and so giving. So thank you so much for that also. Pastor Stephen. Good morning, everybody. First of all, before we get to the reading, I wanted to inform you all that Treat Street went amazing. And I wanted to thank you all for candy and time donated, but most of all for prayers and the love shown to our community. Did you want to say anything? No, no? okay. Um, we had an estimated of around 50 families show up and we had at least 30 of them fill out cards saying that they wanted more information. So that was awesome. But more importantly, we were able to love the families and children within our community. And I wanted to thank you all for that. And with that, we continue our reading of scripture. We are in Luke chapter 12. Last week, we read the parable of the rich young man that Jesus tells. It's about the guy who suddenly has a lot of, lot of crops grow up. And he's like, all right, I need to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Uh, to which God responds, uh, you're going to die tonight, so that's all going to be useless. I'm paraphrasing. That's not how Jesus told the story. <laughs> but we pick up in Luke 12, 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? 
Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the wild, how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And now, if you would please stand and join us in worship. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God is waiting for us.
week for this one so next you know what that means you should all have it down for one 
Dr. Butner, you have a pass. Uh, but it means we get to start a new one next week. I'm excited. So last time, it's if God is for us, then who could ever be against us? Romans 8.31. And for those of you who are confused, the motions are help you, to help you remember it because we're all children, really. So one more time, and I think we got it. And if anybody comes up to me after service and can tell me, I do have dum-dums. <laughs> if God is for us, then who could ever be against us? Romans 8.31. And now, kids, let's go do children's church. As you're familiar with, we always take a moment in our service to pray for um, some who are on our hearts. Uh, the town of Foxborough had a loss this week. Our former selectman and a friend of Union Church passed away, Mark Sullivan. He's the guy who installed the windows for us a few months ago. And less than a month ago, his crew put in a new bulkhead for us. Uh, and he's... He once, we once had a party here who since moved away, but who needed a new roof and had no money. And she got a new roof at no charge um, for Mark Sullivan. So we will pray for his family this morning. Also, Ruth Weber has shared that a cousin of hers in, who lives in Puerto Rico, has lived in Puerto Rico for a year, is in ICU in very critical condition with heart trouble, so we will pray for that. And a couple of the other ongoing prayer requests, if your request is ever not prayed for on a Sunday, please remember they are all prayed for during the week. Psalm 31, beginning at verse 19 says, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you, in the shelter of your presence, you hide them from the intrigues of men. In your dwelling place, you keep them safe from accusing tongues. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed his wonderful love to me. When I was in a besieged city, this is King David writing, in my alarm I said I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful. Heavenly Father, we are here today to express our love for you. We love you, Lord. We are grateful that you hear our cry. And we are in great need. And when our hearts are rent and we are troubled, we may call to you for help. And we, you will see us, you will hear us, you will show your wonderful love to us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for these words of King David, which are true in our day as well, and in our lives, and in our experience. Father, thank you for who you are. You are a God who is perfect in your holiness. Out of your holiness comes your love, your graciousness, your grace, our unmerited favor bestowed on us. Father, your vast power and wisdom. We worship you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one and only God who created all things and who came in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ, and gave his life on the cross that our sin might be forgiven when we trust in him and we might have resurrection at the moment of our passing to life eternal in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. And Heavenly Father, we do bring before you Ruth Weber's cousin. We pray, Heavenly Father, that whatever his situation is, that his medical treatment would be effective and that you would intercede on his behalf, that his heart might function properly. 
So, Father, be with him in that place and grant this blessing, we would ask. Be with the family, the Sullivan family, and a wide circle of friends with the passing of Mark. Grant great comfort, we pray, and truly a difficult time for many, many people. Thank you for Mark's generosity to us and to many others in this community. Father, be with Danny's friend, Dean, struggling with the loss of his son at only the age of 22. Father, be with him, and may this be a time that you work powerfully in his life for good and for his soul and spirit. Be with Brian's sister, Cheryl, as she has an eye doctor appointment soon that is quite critical. Father, we pray that you might bring healing to her eyes and that you would bless her and you would be with her and guide the doctor in this medical process. For Franz, the family of Franz, friend Peggy who has passed away and for her friends, grant comfort also, we would pray today. Father, we have many ongoing prayer requests. Thank you that George Sirikis is here this morning, and as he will begin a new treatment in November, we pray that you would bless it to him and preserve and keep him and enable him to begin that process promptly. Continue to keep him well, we would pray. Father, for other ongoing prayer requests, we would pray that you might continue to respond and hear and answer. We remember our missionaries, Ian and Becca, ride out in the nation of Niger today. Father, as they minister in a place that at times, the very region where they are is threatened by war. Father, grant them protection, grant them strength, grant them clarity in their mission, and Father, bless them in every way we would ask and continue to lift them up as they do your work in that place. Be with our nation, the United States of America, in this time of difficulty and division and turmoil. The answer is not a political candidate. The answer is far greater. A turning, a spiritual renewal, a revival, a turning to your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, as you have in the past in our history, bring a great revival and renewal, we would pray. Father, thank you for those who meet here walking the road of recovery from addiction. Thank you for each and every one continue to work in that community who are precious in your sight, that they may know you and have true freedom in every sense. Father, we worship you today by praying as our master Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Whose father? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are blessed to have a special guest with us, which we have been, who we have been anticipating for quite some time. Dr. Glenn Butner has been at Gordon Conwell Seminary since July. I didn't realize how short a time it was, so we're delighted to be hopefully one of the first places to invite him to come and share. He's married to Lydia, they have three children. He grew up in North Carolina and spent eight years teaching at Sterling College in Kansas. He's an author on Christian dogmatics and a board member for the, if I'm pronouncing it properly, the Kifa Project, which is a mission to Rwanda, a joint American and Rwandan mission effort, wonderful thing. He's written a number of books, I'm gonna be Purchasing Jesus the Refugee, it sounds intriguing to me. And most importantly this morning, he's a runner, which is dear to my heart. So we welcome him today to our pulpit, Dr. Butner. 
Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be here. I did not get a run in this morning before I came, so I've got energy here to preach this morning. Um, My wife and three kids and I did move up to Massachusetts in July, and after spending uh, about six weeks in a temporary apartment, we moved into uh, uh, a permanent home in Rowley, uh, which, if you go up one, uh, is about 20 minutes past Peabody in between Haverhill and Gloucester, which (laughs) then I stayed long enough to realize that I'm not saying any of that right, so it's Peabody, and so for all I know, I don't live in Rowley. I live in a differently named town. Um... But I'm, I'm settling in in Massachusetts. We're really enjoying it here beyond the pronunciation. We're loving the weather, the community, the, uh, the gracious invitations. Um, having spent most of my last decade in Kansas, I have to say I'm not fully a New Englander yet in terms of being a Patriots fan. But there are few things you could do to win me over more than invite me to a church potluck in the hometown of the Patriots. So thank you for having me. Um, the Chiefs never did that, so you're off to a wonderful start. Um, <laughs> But I have more important things to talk about this morning than football or uh, pronunciation. So if you'll join me in prayer, I then want to talk a little bit about the Trinity in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. And thank you for being a father who does love us and listen to us in prayer. Thank you for sending your son to intercede for us and your spirit to dwell within us, guiding us in our prayer. And I pray this morning as I preach uh, that I might be true to your word and in so doing that I might help us to better understand how Father, Son, and Spirit guide us in our prayers. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the doctrines I do specialize in, I I teach systematic theology up at Gordon-Conwell, but that's the doctrine of the Trinity. And so this is the claim that God is one being who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's one God but we know this God in a threefold way as Father, Son, and Spirit. And often in the classroom, we have to go into lots of philosophy and do lots of complex intellectual reasoning to try and understand what that means because it's tremendously important. But I found while that's often done in the classroom, and I've met many uh, very gifted individuals in the local church that are wrestling with these ideas, that in my experience at least, there are many church congregations where not as many people have tried to connect those ideas, however much you understand them, to your regular experience as a Christian. And so I began asking in my classes, I'd have seminary students, um, I'd have undergraduate students, I have, I've done some youth ministry, I have high school students, and I would say, Um, How do you connect the doctrine of the Trinity to your spiritual lives? How do you actually experience God as Father, Son, and Spirit? And I began to see that not many people were able to answer that question very well. Uh, Now, it might be that you have a very good answer to that question. It might be this is your first Sunday in church and the idea of the Trinity is new to you. But I think it's an important thing for us to wrestle with and understand. If we claim that that is fundamentally who our God is, Father, Son, and Spirit and that we are called as Christians to be praying continuously to God, then we need to figure out how we're praying to Father, Son, and Spirit. And here I see two risks. One risk is that we might detach our spiritual experience altogether from the Trinity. That's an idea maybe we learn in Sunday school. Uh, Maybe if you're in a denomination that practices uh, Trinity Sunday, you hear it preached about once a year. Maybe you read a book about it occasionally, but day to day, it doesn't really affect how you worship, how you pray. It doesn't shape your spiritual disciplines. And that's, that's what I found was true of so many people in my classes that I asked. How is your prayer Trinitarian? How is your worship Trinitarian? They couldn't really answer that question, even though many of them were bound for ministry. On the other hand, there's a second risk, and this might be that The doctrine of the Trinity is almost entirely shaped by our experience. I one time was in a youth group and I asked uh, the same question, how do you understand Father, Son, and Spirit to be related to our prayer? And a young lady raised her hand and she said, spirit bumps. I said, I'm not really familiar with that terminology. What do you mean by spirit bumps? And she said, well, you know, when you're praying or you're worshiping and you kind of get goosebumps on the back of your neck and you feel excited, that's the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, I know that the Holy Spirit is working in me. And I said, wow, that's, I like that spirit bumps. I'll use that again. And here I am, true to that word. And yet, I think we need to be a bit cautious here. How do we know when those bumps are the Holy Spirit and when they're just regular old goosebumps? 
Um, how do we tell the difference between a biological phenomenon and God acting in my life? My experience is not trustworthy at the end of the day. Maybe you can think of an optical illusion that you've experienced or a, a social situation you've entirely misread. We can't always trust our experience like we can the word of God. So one risk is that we detach spirituality from our understanding of the Trinity. The other is that the Trinity is only something about spirituality not firmly rooted in divine revelation. And I believe our goal as Christians is to be here in the middle avoiding both risks, having a firm foundation in Scripture for knowing why we confess one God in three persons, and yet having that confession fundamentally shape our experience as Christians. And so I've only been given about half an hour this morning, but I want to take some steps toward that goal of what I think the Christian spiritual life should be. And I want to do that initially by looking briefly at a passage in John chapter 5. So I'm not going to work through the entirety of John chapter 5, but to give you a little bit of context here, uh, Jesus has just healed a man on the Sabbath. And we would think this would just be an amazing miracle, but it's actually a controversial thing because remember the Ten Commandments, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy is included there. And part of that honoring has for a long time in Judaism involved not working. And by the first century, there have been layer upon layer of additional sort of religious interpretations that have been put on top of that commandment to help the people of God try to understand what it means to honor the Sabbath. But among those interpretations of what does it mean to work was even the interpretation that you shouldn't even save someone's life on the Sabbath. A lot of people would say this at the time. Why? Well, the greatest commandment is love God. The second greatest commandment is love your neighbor. And so if our love of God is manifest on the Sabbath, the theory was, and Jesus debunks it here, but the theory was that we should love God more than our neighbor in terrible need, even to the point of not saving a life on the Sabbath if it involves work. Jesus acts against this when he heals on the Sabbath. But the religious leaders come in and they say, hold on, why did you heal on the Sabbath? You're breaking the commandments of God. And Jesus answers in chapter 5, verse 17, in a way that surprises his audience. He says, my father is working until now, and I am working. We have some later texts from Jewish rabbis preserving an argument for us that goes back earlier where some Jewish theologians were wondering, well, what does it mean for God to rest on the Sabbath? You go back to Genesis 1, and on the seventh day, God rested. Does he continue to do this on the Sabbath? What does that even mean? And wrestling with Scripture, they began to realize, well, hold on, people are born and they die on the Sabbath, on Saturdays, the Jewish Sabbath. That doesn't happen without God, right? So God must be working in that, people being born and dying. And the rain falls and the sun shines, the sun rises and sets, we have day and night, we have wind, the earth continues to spin. All of the things that we expect from the physical world, but all of that is under God's sovereign control. So God's not resting in a way that he's not still governing our world, because if God were to stop sustaining our world, we would all return to the dust from whence we came. There would be nothing left. And so these, these same rabbis began to realize, well, God is still working on the Sabbath. Jesus is sort of appealing to that argument when he says, well, my father is working today, and so I'm working too. Which, not surprisingly, upsets those same religious leaders because they don't think that Jesus is equal with God. And so in verse 18, they plan to kill him because now not only is he breaking the Sabbath, but he's saying that he's equal to God. And that's, that's not really a good thing for us to do. This would be the perfect chance, if that's not what Jesus thought of himself, for him to say, well, hold on a moment, put those stones down. That's not what I was trying to say. But in verse 19, that's not what he does. He doubles down. Verse 19, after they're planning to kill him, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the Son does likewise. Three things to point out really quickly here. First of all, the beginning of this verse, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. 
Or in some translations, the son can do nothing on his own. There's nothing that the son is doing that he's doing apart from the father. They are working together in everything that Jesus is doing. A second thing, though, whatever the father does, the son does. Whatever the Father does, Jesus, the Son, is right there with him doing it. We saw this in the beginning of John's Gospel when we're told that the Word was with God in the beginning and that everything that was created was created through him. The Son is right there in creation. Later on in Jesus' answer here, he shares other things that he does that the Father also does. For example, judging. We'll come back to that Raising the dead, so giving life again. They do together. The Father does not work without the Son. The Son does not work without the Father in terms of the divine actions of the Father and the Son. I should add a quick theological footnote here. What about the human things that Jesus does? For theological reasons that are kind of beyond what we have time for this morning, but I get to eat with you and have a Q&A, so feel free to ask more then. Christians have come to say, well, there are certain human things. Only the Son was incarnate. Only the Son was born of Mary. So only the Son died. That's a human action. Only the Son was hungry. Only the Son slept. We don't want to say the Holy Spirit was asleep on the boat along with the Son. But anything divine that they're doing, creating, saving, forgiving sins, providentially governing the universe, Father, Son, and Spirit are working together in doing that. With the clarification of one more important word here in verse 19, and that's the word likewise. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. There's still somehow a personal distinction between them. We can still tell the difference between Father and Son. And by the way, the Spirit's not named here, but the Spirit is involved in all divine actions too. We could go through Scripture, starting with creation, right there, Genesis 1 2, the Spirit's hovering over the waters involved in that. And moving from there through the major actions of God, we can find the Holy Spirit involved too. Now, if I teach the doctrine of the Trinity, I usually cover eight main aspects of the doctrine, and this is only one of them, but it's known as the doctrine of inseparable operations. And Christians have accepted this on the testimony of John 5, plus other places in Scripture, for centuries, for millennia. This is the idea, again, that Father, Son, and Spirit work together. They do all the same actions in everything that they do toward creation. So that's some doctrine. There's a lot more we could say about it, a lot of philosophical analysis, exegetical analysis in the Word. But I want to think about the pastoral uh, implications of this for a minute. Because you see, this should fundamentally shape the way that we pray, pray and the way that we worship. For example, if one of the prayers that uh, Pastor Dudley just shared, if it's answered in a big way, or if it's answered in a small way, and we're thanking God next week or in a month for that answer, then we have to make sure that we're careful, not only thanking the Father, but also the Son and the Spirit. Sometimes we can fall into this mistake where we're thinking of, I'm praying, the Father's answering that prayer, and the other two aren't really involved in this at all. But that's not the picture that John 5 is showing for us. If our prayer is answered, whatever the Father is doing, the Son does likewise. The Son is involved in answering that prayer. And so we can help make our understanding of our spiritual lives more Trinitarian when we begin to name that, when we thank God for answering our prayers. Thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for bringing me to Massachusetts. It's been an answer to my prayers in many ways. But second, if they're all three involved in all of their actions, then we have to recognize that all three divine persons view us in the same way. In my experience in the church, I've offered pastoral counseling to people before, and sometimes they have an understanding of Christianity that goes like this. The Father is wrathful toward us. The Father's just generally a wrathful person. And then the loving Son came along and died for me and made the Father no longer wrathful toward me. And so I really need to lean on the Son in my prayer life because the Son's the loving one. There's some truth in there, but it's been distorted a little bit. If you think that God is not wrathful, I think you're not reading Scripture very closely, but if you think that only the Father is wrathful and only the Son is loving, I think we're also not reading Scripture very closely. 
After all, if you turn to Revelation 19, you have this picture of a rider on a white horse who judges and makes war with justice and who will trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God. That's not the Father. That's the Son described in Revelation 19. The Son has wrath because anything the Father does, the Son does likewise. And the Father, of course, is also loving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Speaking of the Father sending the Son. That's based on love. And so we have to be careful in the way we think about how we're praying and why we're praying that we recognize that the cross did resolve the problem of the wrath of God for us, but that we don't divide the persons and say, the Father's the angry one, the Son's the loving one, and then forget altogether about the Spirit. That's a mistake. All three are involved in the wrathful judgment coming at the end, and all three, because of their shared love, sent the Son to die on the cross. And because of that, all three now, if you believe, view you favorably. So they're all working together. And that's why later on in John 5, we see that the Son is also involved in judging. And as John continues, we see the historical saving works of God, like the Exodus, now being associated with the Son. And then the Son says, I'm going to send another advocate just like me, the Holy Spirit, because they're working together. Okay, so that's, that's one God. They all work together. But how are they three persons? God is one and three. In our prayer life, how do we think about the difference between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? So that's pretty important too. If you read through the way Christians have been interpreting the Bible for centuries, I think we see several different patterns here for how to think about this and help us understand our prayer. The most common, I would name a linear model. You see... As we're looking at the doctrine of inseparable operations, Father, Son, and Spirit are doing everything together, we still see an ordering or a pattern. The easiest place to point it out is just in the big story of Scripture. The Father sends the Son, born of Mary, living a sinless life on earth, dying on the cross, ascending again to the Father after the resurrection, and then the Spirit is sent at Pentecost to live within the church. We have this pattern. It begins from the Father, through the Son, to the Spirit. And we can see this time and again throughout Scripture, both in individual verses and in larger narratives. But this shows us that the likewise, we can still, in the shared work of Father, Son, and Spirit, we can still differentiate between them. One way to do that is to see kind of this pattern. So remember creation again. John says in chapter 1, everything is made through the Word, following that pattern. The Father creates through the Word. And of course, in the Spirit, there in Genesis 1-2. Theologians call this a Trinitarian taxis, a Trinitarian ordering. I think this matters a whole lot for how we pray. Um, why? Well, Actions where God is moving toward us are from the Father, through the Son, to the Spirit. But then when God is working in us to draw us back to Him, what we see is the pattern in the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father. That line is reversed if it's bringing us back to God. And we see that in prayer. Romans 8.26, for example. When we don't know what to pray for as we should, the Spirit intercedes for us. In Ephesians, Paul uses the language of praying in the Spirit. We have to see at the end of John's Gospel here, one of the main things the Spirit is doing is reminding us of Jesus' teaching, convicting us about sin. The Spirit in us is the start and source of our prayers. Even when we don't know what to say, we might find ourselves saying the right thing because of the Spirit leading us. So we pray in the Spirit. We also pray through the Son. The best place to see this in Scripture is in the book of Hebrews. So in Hebrews, Jesus is described as the great high priest. Of course, the priest is the mediator that goes into the holy presence of God once a year with those sacrifices, if it's the selected priest, on behalf of all the people. Well, Jesus is in an even higher place in the presence of God through the ascension, advocating on our behalf. Hebrew says, as a Melchizedekian priest, a priest even better than the Old Testament priests. And so when we're praying 
to the Father, as we're told to do in the Lord's Prayer that we all prayed together, our Father who art in heaven, we do so in the Spirit through the mediation of the Son. And that mediation is why oftentimes when we pray, we might conclude, in your Son's name, amen. Or in the name of the Son, amen. Now, we've maybe been doing this our whole lives. You may be very familiar with these patterns of talking, but perhaps you've not stepped back and stopped to think about it for a minute, but it's showing us something really important about the Trinity. The Trinity is not an abstract idea for seminary, or at least it's not that alone. The Trinity is a fundamental way of describing our relationship with God because it names who God is as Father, Son, and Spirit. But after I talk through this linear model, hey, we pray in the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father, people often think, and maybe one, one or two of you in here are wondering the same thing, well, do I only pray to the Father? Can I not pray to the Son and to the Spirit? I mean, that's a pretty important question, right? And it's interesting, the main pattern in Scripture certainly is prayer to the Father, that's the Lord's Prayer, but it's not the only pattern. And so we come to a second way of thinking about the Trinity in prayer, and I would call this the coordinate model. Those names aren't coming from Scripture, but the patterns are, because we can see at times, though most prayer is directed to the Father in Scripture, we can see prayer to the Son and to the Spirit also. For example, Beautiful short prayer, sometimes in Aramaic, Maranatha, or in English, come Lord Jesus. We see this pop up a few times in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 is an example. It's just a short prayer. Jesus, come quickly. Jesus, we need you. It's okay to pray to the Son. Of course, because if you say, I can only pray to the Father, but not the Son, you're kind of implying that the Father is fully God. He's really running the show, and the Son, the son is not fully there. So I'm going to address the Father, but not the Son. I think that would be a mistake. That linear role sets the pattern. We often pray more to the Father, but you can speak to any of the three. What about the Spirit? Sometimes we forget that the Spirit is a person. We may reduce the Spirit to this impersonal force, but that would be making the Spirit less than the Father and the Son. And we see in Scripture prayer addressed to the Spirit as well. One of the more confusing examples, but most interesting ones in my mind, is in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel is brought to see this valley of dry bones, the dead soldiers of Judah, and he's told by God the Father, prophesy to the Ruach. That's Hebrew. And it's going to come in and bring these bones back to life. Usually it's not a great idea to bring in original languages in a sermon, but here it's really important because that word can be translated in a lot of different ways. One is breath. But another is spirit. That same word can mean breath or spirit. So you might be reading Ezekiel 37, and if your translation chose breath, you might be missing something here. Because that same word that speaks of the breath that was breathed into Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, that same word to talk about the breath that's being given to these dead bones is also the word used in the Old Testament to name the spirit. So another way to think about this, because it's the same word, is that God is saying to Ezekiel, prophesy to the Spirit, speak to the Spirit, ask the Spirit to come, and life and breath will return to these bones. It's God commanding Ezekiel to speak and ask to the Spirit. So if God tells us to do this, we know it's okay. We pray in the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father, but we can also pray to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. That's biblically okay. And if you never do that, we might not have a fully Trinitarian prayer life. Quickly, a third way to think about this. I call this the incorporative model. It, it brings us together into a body. If we think about salvation, Paul especially is really clear that salvation is in Christ. He uses that phrase over 70 times in his letters. We are in Christ. Well, what does that mean? There's a lot to be said here, but one thing it means is that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are united to the Son, so that Paul can also say, we have been clothed with Christ. We have put off the old man and put on the new man. We have been buried with Christ, and we are raised with Christ. We were baptized into Christ. All of this language suggests that the Spirit is joining me to the Son, which means because of that being joined to the Son, 
that by grace, I have some of the status that he eternally has had by nature. Paul talks about this in terms of adoption in Romans 8, among other places. Right before uh, 8.31 that we just saw, that we just did as our memory verse, if God is for us, who could be against us? Right before that, he uses the language of adoption. We have been adopted, and if you are in Christ, you are either a son or a daughter of the Father, because the Spirit has joined you to Christ, and you have this status. The Spirit is called a spirit of adoption in the book of Romans. And this matters a lot for prayer, too. Since the Spirit has joined me to Christ, I can pray to the Father the way the Son would speak to the Father. I can see God as my Father. We don't see that Father language very often in the Old Testament, but it's everywhere in the New Testament. And so Jesus can say in Matthew 7 on the Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse 9, Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, who will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We can pray with the confidence of a son or daughter of the Father because of the Trinitarian saving work of God to bring us into that family through adoption. And that should fundamentally shape the way that we pray, not as those who are timid or afraid, although the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, so there's a place for that reverential fear, but not a terror that makes us too nervous to talk to God. We can talk with a familiarity joined with that reverence, once we understand the Trinitarian nature of prayer. And so I've quickly tried to walk us through John 5 here and showing how do we know Father, Son, and Spirit are all God? John 5 is particular about the Son and the Father, but they're doing all things together. No one saves but God. Father and Son and Spirit are saving together. They must be God. They're creating together. No one creates but God. They must be together. And so we have this ordered understanding of God's work, unlike you know, the ancient Greek polytheistic world where you've got Poseidon that controls the ocean and Zeus controlling the skies and they're fighting with each other. Not Christianity. Father, Son, and Spirit work together in all things. And this shapes our prayer. We have to see all three of them answering our prayers. We have to know that all three persons view us the same way because they are equally God and indivisibly united. But we pray to them as distinct in the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father. They're equal, so we pray to all three of them, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. And we do so confidently because the triune God has reached out and adopted us into his family because the Spirit has joined us to the Son. And so at its heart, I hope you see that this doctrine of the Trinity is very pastoral. If this is who God is, it changes everything. Nobody else can relate to their God in the way that Christians can to our God. Not only because ours is the only real God, but because only our God is understood in this way. And so I encourage you today to keep in mind the Trinity as you pray. And the great gift that we have of a Son who came on our behalf to be a mediator and a Spirit who dwells in us to guide our prayers. As the worship team is coming back up, let me pray for us to end this sermon. God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we glorify you and thank you for just for the goodness that you have imparted upon us to enable us to pray to you who are so far above us and beyond us. But you are also in us, Lord, and I thank you for that and for your mercy. I pray these things in the Son's name. Amen.
pages of notes. Isn't God wonderful that he reveals himself so clearly in the pages of scripture, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how we can interact with him with some understanding in prayer and in who he is. We can be so grateful for that. You're invited to stay if you have time. We'd love to have you stay. I know it's only a little after 11, but maybe you have an appetite. I always do. We're going to have a potluck lunch, and then Dr. Butner will take a few questions. We're grateful for him taking the time for that. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours in abundance. Amen. <laughs>